Hey everybody, this is Yuri from Sure. If you're buying a new microphone or if you're buying a microphone for the first time, you may find that the manufacturer's spec sheet could be a little intimidating. So for this, how do you do that? Let's go over microphone specifications and the ones that are most relevant to the sound. As we go into detail about these specifications, we're gonna look at four very, very different Shure mics. The Beta 52A, the KSM-8, which are both dynamic, the KSM-313, a ribbon microphone, and the SM-81, a condenser mic. The most relevant specification for the sound of your microphone is probably going to be the frequency response. This is a frequency response chart of the MV7, the microphone that I'm currently speaking into. Now, all frequency response chart starts at 20 hertz and end at 20,000 hertz, which is the extension of our entire human hearing range. Values above zero means that the microphone is more sensitive to those frequencies and they will sound a little bit accentuated. Likewise, any values below zero means that a microphone is less sensitive to those frequencies and they'll be sort of attenuated. As you can see here, the MV7 has a slight boost in the upper frequencies and a slight attenuation in the lower frequencies, which is normally what you would expect for a microphone that's tuned for vocals. Let's start with the Beta 52A, which is our awesome kick drum mic. As you can see, the response here is extremely tailored. You have this giant boost at about four kilohertz, that is to accentuate the attack on the kick. And then you have four different curves near the low end to show you that as you get closer and closer to the kick drum, you get a nice increase in the low end. This one, two punch of a high frequency boost and a variable low frequency boost is what gives the Beta 52A its awesome signature sound. Now take a look at the KSM-8, which is designed to be a vocal mic. You see, just like with the MV7 that I'm speaking into, you have a gradual decrease in the low frequencies below 100 hertz. And then it stays relatively flat until you hit about 2.5 kilohertz or about 3 kilohertz, where you start to see a couple of little peaks in the presence area. You can see, however, with the KSM-8, those presence peaks are a little bit smaller than what you're seeing with the MV7 that I'm talking into. So this is a fun one. The KSM-313 is a ribbon mic, but also it has two different sounds depending on whether you're pointing at the front of the mic or into the rear of the mic. One of the coolest things about ribbon mics is that they have a generally flat frequency response, but then they tend to duck down quite a bit in the high frequencies. And you can see that by looking at the front chart. If you look at the rear chart, there's actually a little bit more of a boost in the high frequencies before that drop down starts to happen. So basically you have a somewhat darker side and a somewhat brighter side. This is actually one of the coolest things about ribbon mics, is that rather than giving a significant presence boost like a microphone tuned for vocals, they actually have a pretty decent presence decline, which gives a smoother sound to our ears across the entire spectrum. Finally, let's look at the SM81, which is one of our condenser microphones. I specifically picked this microphone because it has a very, very flat frequency response until you get to about 16 or 17K at the very, very top. This makes the microphone very, very versatile. I can put it on a lot of different sources and get very consistent results. Notice that on the lower end, I have three different response curves, and this is normal for any kind of microphone that has a switch on it that has a high-pass filter. So you can see that the SM81 has a high-pass filter switch with two different settings that affect the low frequencies differently. So what do you practically do with all this information? Well, you can think of the frequency response chart as like a starting point as to what the microphone might best be suited for. Does that mean it's the only thing it's suited for? Absolutely not. In fact, there was a time where uh, Paul, the sound guy, one of our awesome colleagues, joined a virtual meeting where their Beta 52A was his vocal microphone, and it sounded surprisingly darn good. Hi, you're listening to the smooth and sultry sounds of my voice on the Beta 52A by Sure. Now, the second most relevant specification as it relates to the sound of the microphone is going to be the polar pattern chart. Now, we're going to avoid talking about cardioid, omni, and all that good stuff, and just focus on the fact that the polar pattern changes slightly depending on the frequency. One important thing to consider is that you can actually kind of tell if a microphone is a well-built microphone depending on how consistent its polar pattern is across multiple frequencies. So let's take a look at the Beta 52A. As you can see in this chart, the Beta 52A generally stays super cardioid. It becomes even more directional at 2500 hertz and just slightly less directional at 250 hertz. One of the reasons I love talking about the KSM-8 is the consistency of its cardioid pattern. As you can see here, it stays cardioid pretty much the entire time. Only at the really, really high frequencies, like 6K and above, you start to get to see a little lobe, a little bit of sound coming into the back. But that's it. 
when you look at a KSM-313, you see the figure eight pattern that you would expect out of a ribbon mic. But the coolest thing about it is that it stays consistently figure eight across the entire spectrum. And finally, with the SM81, you see that consistency in the cardioid pattern again. At the extremes, like at 100 hertz, you start to see it becoming a little bit more omnidirectional. And at the other extreme, at 10 kilohertz, you start to see it forming more, a little bit more of a directional super cardioid shape. But generally, it's consistent in between. Wonderful. So why do we care about this? Again, it's just a really good sign of a well-made mic when it can keep its polar pattern consistent across a large part of the spectrum. You're always gonna have something at the extremely low frequencies where a directional mic will become a little bit less directional and at the extremely high frequencies where it's gonna become a little bit more directional. But it should stay pretty consistent across the middle. Third most relevant, and probably my favorite, is the sensitivity. Although the sensitivity doesn't actually tell you anything about what the microphone is going to sound like. But it does tell you a little bit about how the microphone operates and how much gain it's going to need. Engineers measure the sensitivity of the microphone by shooting a 1000 Hz sine wave at it at a pressure of 1 Pascal, or 94 decibels SPL. And then they measure the voltage that comes out. Here's a fun fact, 94 dB SPL sounds like it's pretty loud, and it is, but it just shows you how sensitive our ears and microphones are. 94 dB SPL is one Pascal of pressure, and right now you have 101,000 Pascals pressing against your face. Anyway, let's go back to sensitivity. You put in one Pascal of pressure, you get some voltage out. The higher the voltage, the more sensitive the microphone is. The lower the voltage, the less sensitive the microphone is. Let's look at some examples. Here's a wonderful chart made by my colleague Alex Case at University of Massachusetts Lowell. It shows the sensitivities of a bunch of different mics that they have in their mic locker. The color codings are for whether a microphone is dynamic, ribbon, or condenser. As you can see, condenser microphones generally tend to be more sensitive, and dynamic microphones tend to be less sensitive. A lot of people believe that the SM7B is our least sensitive microphone, but as you can see here, it's actually the Beta 52A. If you look at the sensitivity rating of the Beta 52A, you see that you get 0.6 millivolts out of one Pascal of pressure, which translates to negative 64 dB volts. Now, how do we get away with something not that sensitive? Well, again, it's a kick drum mic. You put it inside the kick drum or right next to the kick drum, which can get very, very loud when you get really close to them. We can compare it to the KSM-8, which is also a dynamic microphone, but it comes in at 2.66 millivolts per one Pascal, or about negative 51.5 dBV. Ribbon mics generally have a similar sensitivity to dynamic microphones, and you can see here that the KSM-313 falls in between the Beta 52A and the KSM-8 at about negative 54.5 dBV per Pascal. Finally, condenser mics tend to be a little bit more sensitive, and you can see here the SM81 comes in at about 5.6 millivolts or negative 45 dBV for one Pascal of pressure. So why do we care about sensitivity at all? Again, it doesn't really tell you anything about what a microphone is going to sound like, but it does tell you how much gain the microphone is going to need. So for example, if I wanted to use the Beta 52, which is a low sensitivity microphone, that is designed to be put pretty close to the sound source where you can get a lot of sound and a lot of pressure into the microphone. I probably wouldn't want to put the Beta 52A somewhere like 10 feet away from the sound source because it's just not that sensitive. Finally, let's look at two very, very related things, maximum SPL and total harmonic distortion. Maximum SPL basically just tells you how much sound pressure a microphone can take before it starts getting distorted. The measurement will either say 1% total harmonic distortion or 0.5% total harmonic distortion. The good news is that for most dynamic microphones, maximum SPL is really not that big of a deal. For example, if you look at the Beta 52A, it gets 1% total harmonic distortion at 174 decibels. That's pretty much putting the microphone right on top of a rocket engine. Likewise, with the KSM-8, there's not even a measurement because no one cares. You're not gonna distort it. Go nuts. Ribbon microphones generally tend to handle a lot of SPL just as well as dynamic microphones do. For example, if you look at the KSM-313, its maximum SPL rating is 146 decibels, still way louder than anything you're ever gonna record. With condenser microphones, you do have to pay a little bit more attention to the maximum SPL setting. For example, if you look at the SM81, you can see that its maximum SPL is roughly between 128 and 145, and you can see that there's a total harmonic distortion reading at 131 decibels SPL. Now, that's still really, really loud, but it's actually achievable. For example, if you put the microphone right in front of the bell of a trumpet and the trumpet is just blasting out high notes, it can get into the 120s and the 130s, so be careful.
Now, finally, even though I just said finally the, the moment before, I wanted to really quickly show you self-noise, which only applies to condenser microphones. Also called equivalent noise level, it is simply just the amount of noise the electrical components of a condenser microphone make during regular operation. The lower the noise number, the better. Here are some examples of Shure condenser microphones and their equivalent noise levels or self-noise levels. As a basis of comparison, professional recording studios generally provide about 25 or 30 decibels of noise. And there you go. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments and we will see you next time.